Hello everyone, DM Gashbad here. I have been trying out some new game systems, but today we are back in the old world with another game of classic Warhammer Quest. As usual, we are using the Louts of Chaos. The Louts of Chaos are my adventuring group. They may be following the path of chaos, but they're not following it in a straight line because they're usually pretty drunk. They are staggering down the road to damnation and they frequently get lost along the way. Just to review the group members real fast, our leader is Leaf the Legbiter, who is a barbarian. He is battle level 3 with 27 wounds. He also has a mighty toughness of 8 due to his war helm and king shield of Tilia. The shield also allows him to ignore one hit once per adventure. He's also got a bunch of other equipment and magical items. He has a throwing axe, he has a bunch of lucky charms a number of healing items, and a bunch of magical weapons, the most important of which are his favorite club, which is plus one to hit and does plus one damage per level, so plus three damage, and the Blade of Leaping Bronze, which gives him plus two attacks. He also, of course, has the Lantern, which means that he does all the exploring, goes first in every combat round, and is nominally the leader. Next up in the initiative order is my fallen wizard, Hundert Luftbloon. Hundert is battle level two, he has 16 wounds and a toughness of 5 thanks to Bograt's crown and a ring of protection. He starts with 11 power. These are little tokens you can use to power your spells throughout the game. They get replenished after every adventure. He also stores 3 in an orb of might and 2 in his wizard staff. His wizard staff also allows him to reroll the power die once per adventure. The staff can also be used as a weapon. He's minus 1 to hit with it, but he's also plus 1 toughness, which is nice. When he wants to go on the offense, he has an axe that is plus one to hit and plus one attack. For spells, he has Confuse, Lightning Bolt, Heal Wounds, Freeze, and Cure Small Wounds. Further up the batting order, we have Naughtiness Maximus, my pit fighter. He has 27 wounds with a toughness of four, five with his two pieces of pit armor if the opponents hit him on a five or a six. He has a Magical Fist Spike, which causes an extra d6 wounds on a hit roll of a 6, which is nice because the Fist Spike gives him plus 2 attacks and also allows him to move into the square of any enemy he just killed with it. He also has two Knee Spikes. Those are good for an additional attack at Strength 2. Strength 2 doesn't sound like much, but consider that he has upped his damage, so he is doing 2d6 damage instead of 1d6 extra damage for all of his attacks. He also has a number of healing items, the very good healing potions, for example, and rerolls from Lucky Charms. He also has the Chalice of Vigor, which for one combat allows all the companions to add an extra D3 damage on the tit roll of a 6, and the Time Freeze Ring, which can give them an extra combat round once per adventure. Finally, we have Ivor Shando. He is a very chaotic looking dwarf who replaced my Chaos Warrior Sir Osis of the Liver when he got too mutated and wandered up north to take part in a Path to Glory campaign. He is battle level 2 with 18 wounds, again a toughness of 8 thanks to the extra equipment he's got. Being relatively new, he doesn't have quite as much equipment as the rest of the characters. He does have a couple of rerolls. He has a single healing potion. His favorite weapon is Ogre Slayer, which is plus three strength for him because he is a dwarf, and Boots of Battle, which give him plus one attack at minus one to hit and plus one strength. So that's our warriors in a nutshell. Let's go and look at the adventure that they'll be taking part in today. We're still working our way through the Lair of the Orc Lord expansion. There's only two adventures that I haven't done in that book, and so we roll one up randomly and we get a hound for a hound. So the backstory for this is that we were out with a local marauder chieftain and we went on a hunting expedition, and during that, his favorite hunting hound, his favorite chaos hound, got eaten by Growler the Squig Hound. The chieftain is very upset and hires us to go hunt down Growler in the orc lair. Being great northern heroes, we may normally turn down a job this petty, but we were supposed to be looking after the Chaos Hound during this particular hunt, so we kinda have to. But you know, we understand, half of my guys have picked up a pet dog on their adventures, so it's fine. This is actually one of the more straightforward battles. We just go through the dungeon as usual. When we get to the objective room, Gorgut Slayer, we roll on the chart as a normal, but we add a Growler in to the mix. Once we've defeated all the enemies, we roll on a chart to see what our reward is. So we set up the dungeon deck as usual, 12 cards including the Collapsed Passage and the Shaman's Den. Shuffle those out, draw out 6, add in the objective room, shuffle those, those go on the bottom, the remaining 6 go on top. 
we draw the starting room and we get a T-section. Normally, this really concerns me because, of course, you have the potential of not finding the objective room on the path that you choose and having to go all the way back through the dungeon. But this time, I'm feeling good about it. I think this is going to cut down the time that we spend in this dungeon. I think I'm going to choose the correct path. Power of positive thinking, right? Still, I'm going to stack the odds in my favor. When you divide up the cards down the other passageways, one side is going to end up with four cards that could hold the objective room, and one side is going to end up with three. I'm going to go down the right-hand path. I'm going to choose the one with the four cards that could be the objective room. So we roll up the first power score of the game. We get a three snow monsters jump out and attack us. We get to go straight on to the exploration phase because, of course, I've lined my guys up right next to the door in that starting room. We immediately get a corridor, which is fine, and we go on to the next turn. Next round, and we roll a power score of 3 again. This, of course, means that we've actually rolled 2 the last 2 rounds. 100 being battle level 2 adds 1 to these rolls. Unless you roll a 1, then you're stuck with 1 and you get an event card. No event this round, so we just move down the hall like this. New round, power score 5, move up to the end of the corridor, we explore in the exploration phase, we get a guard room, so there's going to be an event in here one way or the other. Power score of 4 as we file into the room, we put our backs to the walls because I feel like that's the best defensive arrangement in this situation. We draw an event card and we get a monster, so we go to the Lair of the Orc Lord book and we roll on the monster level 2 to 3 chart and we get 12 giant spiders and 12 giant bats. It has been a while since I've fought these things. The bats get placed first because they are listed first in the encounter. They also get to immediately attack because they have the ambush rule. However, with low weapon skill and strength, they don't really pose much of a threat to my guys. They do bite Hundred for two points of damage, but he has got that four power still sitting around. Might as well use it to cast Heal Wounds. Heals that right back. New round and roll the maximum power of seven. Leaf is up first, and he has to roll to see if he goes Berserk, being a Barbarian and all. On a 6, he'll get an extra attack for the rest of the combat. On a 1, he just slashes around wildly and causes 1 point of damage to every friendly warrior that is adjacent to him. He doesn't roll either, and so he's just going to fight like usual. These creatures are kind of squishy, so he doesn't need the extra damage from his magic club, so he's going to use the Blade of Leaping Bronze for plus 2 attacks, which he uses to promptly kill the 3 bats in front of him. Hundred's up next, my wizard. He has got power to burn, so he's going to cast his best attack spell. He's going to use Freeze, and he rolls five on that, which means five creatures in the same board section take five points of damage. That's enough to kill five bats. And then he's going to feel real confident after that. He's just going to jump into the center of the room, and he's not going to go defensive. He's not going to use his wizard staff. He's going to use that axe that is plus one to hit, plus one attack. And he's going to use that to just... Cut a big arc in the center of the room and kill four more bats. For those of you who may be new and not familiar with Warhammer Quest, the way you can kill four creatures with two attacks is that you get the death blow rule. So if you kill an enemy with one attack, you can immediately get an extra attack against an enemy that is adjacent to it and adjacent to you. So you can just kind of cleave around your enemies in a big circle. And that's what 100 has just done here, which is really impressive for a wizard. Nodinus Maximus, the pit fighter, is up next. The bats are all dead, so it's time to move on to the spiders. He's well equipped to do this because that magical fist spike of his will let him punch into that corridor to get at more of these guys. Unfortunately, he only kills one spider with his fist spike. He does manage to kill two more with his knee spikes. But a little bit of an off round for Nodinus. Hey, speaking of off rounds though, here comes Ivor Shando. He moves into the corridor and only manages to kill one measly spider. As a dwarf, Ivor is not bad. Battle level 2, he's got two attacks plus an extra attack from those boots of battle. Just didn't roll real well. Thankfully the spiders don't do any better. We've got two spiders facing off against Ivor in that corridor. They both miss. That's not terribly surprising. Ivor has a nice high weapon skill of 5. The giant spiders have weapon skill of 2. They need 5s or more to hit him. New round and a power score of 3. Leaf is up first and he gets to see if he goes berserk. But he's killed 3 bats so he gets to add 3 to the score. So now he'll go berserk on a 3+, plus, which he manages to do. So an extra attack for the rest of the combat. So he dives into that corridor filled with spiders, not really thinking about whether that's a great idea or not. He's going to use his club now for plus one to hit and plus three damage. That easily squishes the two spiders in front of him, but now that means that he has blocked off the corridor completely because he's standing next to Ivor blocking both Nodinus and Hundred. Hundred doesn't mind too much, he's just going to move up into the corridor next to his companions. 
Nonnus is a little bit more upset. He can't do anything. Ivor does manage to get his act together a little bit. He moves up into the space that Leaf had cleared out, and he kills off the next two spiders in line. But that's as far as we can go this round. Hundert does use Confuse on one of the lead spiders, so it loses one attack. So in the monster phase, the spiders move up to attack Ivor. They only get one attack because the other one is Confused, and it misses again. Next round, we get a power score of six. None of my guys are hurt, so Hundert just starts things off with a freeze spell again, rolls that four plus, gets to put four points of damage on the last four spiders, killing them all off and ending the combat. For a treasure, we find we are rolling on the Lair of the Orc Lord chart, which means that we get a magic sword, which causes plus d6 wounds on the hit roll of a six. I've got a bunch of these kinds of magic swords. They're bad. They're not very good. They're worth 100 gold when I go and sell them. So 100 will just take that, add it to the pack. Unfortunately, now it's Leaf's turn to be stuck in this corridor because he goes first, but he can't get through because 100 and Naughtiness are there. In their turn, the three other characters are able to shuffle back into that guard room, but it will have to wait for a bit before we can explore the next room. New round, we get a power score of six. Nobody's hurt, so I don't need to cast any heal spells. Leaf moves back into the guard room. Ivor takes position in a corner, still not quite far enough to explore the next room, not to that passageway yet. New round, power score of four, Leaf moves up, we go into the exploration phase. I'm hoping on this one because we are now to the cards that could be an objective room. Turn over that dungeon card, nap, nah, turns out it's just another corridor. New round, power score seven, we move into said corridor. Power score five, move to the end, explore the next one. It is also a corridor. Okay, they're making us walk for this one. Power score of six, we move further down. Power score of three, move up to the next doorway. We explore in the exploration phase, and we get another corridor. Still no objective room, little disappointing. At least we're not getting ambushed or ending up with any rooms to get attacked. It's okay, we're in for the long haul. Do, do you get it? Because we're walking down a long haul. Anyway, new round, power score three, move up. Next round, power score of one, finally get an event. We draw a monster card, so we roll on the Lair of the Orc Lord chart, and we get 2d6 big uns. That could be pretty entertaining. Big uns are fairly serious. They can be tough customers, unless you roll the bare minimum of two of them. So this will not be terribly challenging. As a pit fighter, Naughtiness Maximus gets to roll on a reaction chart when we get a monster attack from an unexpected event. He rolls a five or six, so he gets an immediate turn, which he uses to slay the big un in front of him. And starting off with the regular warrior turn, we go back to Leaf. Leaf has killed plenty of stuff, so now he is going berserk on a 2 plus for the rest of this dungeon. He immediately does. Expecting us to win this combat, he attempts to break his pin. He's got the duck back skill, so he actually gets plus 1 to this roll. He manages to do so, and so he moves in front of the corridor. So if we kill this guy, which is pretty likely, we can explore at the exploration phase. Anyway, he takes out that magic club of his and bonks this last big gun on the head, ending this combat. For treasure, we get a dragon shield. It's a magical shield that allows us to ignore one hit once per adventure. Ivor can have that, I guess. We move on to the exploration phase. This is the last room in this particular passageway, but it doesn't matter because we get the objective room. Sure enough, this was a nice short dungeon. I was bound to get one of these eventually. So, new round... I could jump into this objective room immediately, but that spiked pit at the front of the room is a real pain. If you ever roll a 1 when fighting next to that pit, then you stumble into it like an idiot and things just get worse from there. So when possible, I'd really rather jump as far forward into these rooms as I possibly can. Not only that, but... Gorgut's Lair Objective Room also has the rule where monsters only appear on the top levels. So if you're occupying spaces on the top levels, that's one less monster that can appear there. So instead of launching myself in there right away, I crowd around that corridor so that in the next round I can jump as far forward as I can. I rolled a power score of 6 for this round, so everything is fine. However, for the next round... I get a power score of one again, so unexpected events. So that's the downside of doing this. The more time you waste positioning and that kind of thing, the more likely it is that you'll get an unexpected event. And we get monsters and we get D6 plus two savage orcs and a savage orc shaman. 
So just when I thought I was going to end this adventure real, real quick, it turns out it was all a trap, and these guys ambushed me, blocking off my escape route. This is a pain for a number of reasons. First off, they're archers and sorcerers, so that they position themselves way far away from me, so I gotta backtrack and go run them down. Also, savage orcs are not bad. They have these bows that are strength 4, they have tattoos, which ignore any hit that you hand to them on a 6+. And the Savage Orc Shaman has a spell that can instantly kill you. So I was seriously thinking about just ignoring these guys, leaving them in the corridor, and jumping into the objective room like I had planned. They wouldn't have been able to shoot at me, they would have had to slowly stomp down the corridor, and hopefully by the time they get to me I would have finished up beating up whatever monsters were in the objective room. I don't necessarily think that it's a bad plan. The issue that I had was that I didn't like the idea of fighting my way past that pit, killing off all the monsters in the objective room, and then these guys show up in the doorway and I have to go fight back across that pit to kill off those guys. So instead I'm going to charge back down this hallway and try and take care of these guys. Leaf does go berserk, but unfortunately not in his Maximus, the pit fighter. He rolls on the reaction chart, and this time he rolls a 1, so he gets no turn this round. He is befuddled or has some sort of pit fighter PTSD and gets bad flashbacks. Anyway, can't act. Most of my guys can't really achieve a whole lot this round. We can't reach them to get into hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Leaf does throw his throwing axe at the shaman. This is where I learn a bunch of new rules. For whatever reason, I actually read the full text of the magic special rule for spellcasters. This is one thing Warhammer Quest does. This is just something that happens with these older games. They've got these giant paragraphs of text. They really want to flood a bunch of flavor text in with the rules. And you also include really important rules inside of other rules. So I always assumed magic. They cast spells. Okay, that's fine. But now nah, there's a bunch of other stuff to it. They are minus one to be hit with missile weapons, which is interesting. They all just have special wards. I would have much rather there had been a special rule that gives people minus one to hit, and they call that something else and just add it to any spellcasters they want to have it. They also always get placed first. And I think that threw me in previous adventures. The shamans would get listed last, and so under the normal rules, that means that you place them last. So whatever archers they came with would get placed furthest away, and the shamans would actually be leading the pack up in front. Uh, that's not how it's supposed to happen. They got a special rule in there that means that you actually place them first, which will put them furthest away. I would have preferred that they had just changed how they listed things and then made that rule unnecessary. Finally, I noticed that these Savage Orcs are a little bit different. The ones that come with the Shaman have the Guards special rule. So if I kill the Shaman, all of these Savage Orcs get plus one attack. Oh, and finally, I did know this, but the Savage Orc Shaman has a magical weapon. It's the Axe of Slashin. If he rolls a four plus to hit you, then he does an extra d6 damage, which is actually pretty significant. Anyway, despite all this, I do huck my throwing axe at the shaman, and I manage to hit, which is great, but then he has a 5 plus ward save with his magical tattoos, and he rolls that 5 or 6 and just ignores my hit, so no damage from me this round. Hundert moves up, but he doesn't have much power to play with this round, he doesn't want to dip into his reserves. Ivor sprints forward because he was the closest to these guys. And then we're on to the monster phase. To start things off, we go with the Shaman's magic, and he casts the spell Da Crunch, which is like a little mini version of the Foot of Gorik. So this ectoplasmic foot stomps down on Hundert, my wizard, causing seven points of damage, which is kind of a lot. Then the shooting starts happening, and I get away relatively unscathed in this case. Nunus Maximus is shot for three points of damage. None of the other hits can get through my armor. At the end of the round, Hundert still has one power sitting around, so he uses that to cast Cure Small Wounds to heal himself up one, and we go on to the next round, get a power score of three. Now we're in sword range. Leaf the Legbiter moves up and does me proud by killing the first two savage orcs in the line. I don't know what Hundred was thinking. I don't know if getting stepped on by magic made him mad or if he's just feeling overconfident, but he actually runs up into that line, into that space that Leaf had cleared out, and he makes an attack and he manages to kill off one of those savage orcs. These guys are fairly tough. It's not easy to do, but Hundred's acting like a proper chaos sorcerer this game. Not in his Maximus can only trudge forward after his companions, and then Ivor moves up to support Hundert and misses with all of his attacks. 
no hatred for greenskins for Chaos Dwarfs. So it's the monster phase, and the Shaman rolls up Hand of Gork, but that wouldn't actually do anything because he's not in combat with anybody, so he gets to re-roll and ends up with Brain Bursta. That's the bad one. That's the one that on a one could instantly kill one of my guys. He targets Naughtiness Maximus, which is not great because he's kind of one of my most powerful warriors. Thankfully, he only causes six points of damage. Still a lot, but much better than just having his head blown off. Weirdly, these Savage Orcs are much less dangerous in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They have a lower strength in their shooting attack, and they don't have Frenzy, which is weird. The only damage we take is Hundert is chopped for one point, but he's still got that Cure Small Wound spell that he can use, and he heals himself for one. New round, and I get a power score of a five, which is enough for Hundert to use the Freeze spell. So we're going to do that immediately, but... It's just not so cold right now, and we only roll one. So one Savage Orc takes one point of damage. I choose the one all the way in the back. It's Thief's turn. He can only move up and attack a single Savage Orc, which he manages to kill. That does allow Hundred to back away now that he's not in combat anymore, and Nottiness Maximus can move up in his place. Ivor picks up the pace a little bit and manages to kill two Savage Orcs, so now we're just down to a wounded Savage Orc and the Shaman, so not bad, Ivor. Back to the monster turn, not in his Maximus is brain bursted again for another six points of damage. You get the sense the shaman knows what kind of wrecking ball is hurtling towards his lines. The last Savage Orc misses and we're on to a new round. We get a power score of five again. We're going to try and solve this with swords. Leaf moves up but is only able to wound the Savage Orc shaman, putting three points of damage on him. Those wards doing the work. Hundred just advances a touch raid to cast a spell if he needs to. Nottiness finally gets to the front line. He's gonna go attack the shaman that's been zapping him with magic this whole time. This first attack misses, then he gets a crit, which if you remember caused an extra d6 damage, so that's gonna be strength 4 plus 3d6. Unfortunately, the shaman goes and passes his tattoo ward save again, so no damage from that. His last Fist Spike attack does 6 points of damage, which is good to the Savage Orc Shaman, does have 16 wounds. So he's not dead yet. We're down to the Knee Spikes. This one comes through for me. He goes and knees the Savage Orc Shaman for 9 points of damage, kills him dead, and he's got one more Knee Spike for that last Savage Orc in the line, and he kills him as well. So it took him a while to get there, but not in this Maximus made his presence felt when he did. So for our magic item, we get the Silver Stone. This is an absolutely fantastic magic item. I got that before. That's what was able to turn not in this Maximus's fist spike magical. So he's going to get that again. I don't know what I'm going to use it on, but it's all good news. Get a magic knee spike or something. To end the round, 100 Luff Balloon heals himself for 6 points of damage and Nottiness for 1, and Ivor just steps back to defend the wizard. Alright, new round and we're going back towards the objective room. Power score of 3, just move on down the hall, 100 heals Nottiness for 1. Another round, power score of 4, Nottiness Maximus healed 3 points of damage. Power score 5, didn't take a picture of this, but we move back up to the passageway and Nottiness is healed 6. So here we are at the doorway, ready to jump into the objective room after a bit of a false start. Roll for the power score. Roll another one! Another one. These monsters have thoroughly trapped this doorway. They do not want us getting in here. Not only that, they got their big guards out because I roll a 66 on the monster chart. 66 means that instead of rolling on the levels 2 to 3 monster chart, we now roll on the levels 4 to 5 chart. So, after rolling a couple things I didn't have the models for, we finally get a Troll and Stone Troll. That's actually not too bad. I think I can handle that one. The trolls are tough, regenerate, magic drain, they've got a vomit attack that can dissolve your armor, but I think it could have been worse. Anyway, no pit fighter reaction, and also the magic drain doesn't happen with the Stone Troll, so the one power that I have for this round doesn't go away. So, start of the warrior phase, Leaf does manage to go berserk, but we have a bunch of fear checks to make. These trolls are fear 6, which is pretty high, so in the end, only Hundert passes his fear tests, and so everyone else has minus 1 to hit these guys. Still, Leaf does pretty well putting 17 wounds on the ordinary troll. 
Hundert, being unafraid as he is, continues to attack with the axe and not with the staff and does five points of damage to the stone troll. That leaves it to Naughtiness Maximus to kill off this stone troll before he can attack and possibly dissolve that hard-to-get pit armor on Naughtiness. Unfortunately, he only causes 19 points of damage with just one shy from getting rid of him. And having an extremely hot and cold game, Ivor misses with all three of his attacks and fails to finish off the regular troll. Would have been nice for that guy to get a good chunk of gold from killing off a big monster like this, but it was not to be. Seeing both these trolls badly hurt, Hundert decides that it's time to break out the Death Stone. The Death Stone is a special magic item. You can use it once per adventure. On a 3+, plus, you can cast a spell for free, so he uses it to cast the Freeze spell. Really, all I want is to put that last point of damage on that Stone Troll, but it goes a little bit better than that, and he rolls a 5, which means that I can put 5 points of damage on both those trolls. That kills off the stone troll, so that gold is going to 100, and it badly wounds the remaining normal troll. In the monster phase, Ivor is hit for only 5 points of damage from this angry troll, and he isn't vomited on, which is great. He is also healed 1 point of damage by 100, but the troll regenerates 5. New round, power score of 6. Leaf starts off by hitting this troll for 6 wounds. Hundred is happy enough staying where he is and letting Naughtiness Maximus come in and finish off those last 7 wounds on the troll, which he immediately does. For treasure, we get a Quake Scroll. We'll give that to Hundred. It's a one-use item that causes a cave-in in the dungeon. So you pick a 2x2 two two square and everyone under there takes 2d6 damage with no deductions for toughness or armor, which is pretty good. As a thank you for getting the scroll, Hundert heals Ivor for 4, Naughtiness for 1. New round, back to the doorway, let's see if we can get into this objective room. No! No we cannot! Third time in a row we roll a 1 on the power score, so another event. And another monster, we haven't gotten a single encounter this game. For this group of monsters, we get a Night Goblin boss with a Sword of Stabbins. So that doesn't allow any armor when he hits you, which is pretty good. He also has six netters to accompany him. At least this group doesn't seem that challenging. It shouldn't take us long to chew through all these people. Leaf immediately goes berserk and kills the boss and a netter. Hundred is stuck without anything to do because the one guy he could have attacked Leaf already slaughtered. Nunnus Maximus steps up and punches his way through four more netters, which leaves Ivor to kill off the last Night Goblin. And can he do that? Yes, that is something that Ivor can handle. He kills off the last Night Goblin. For treasure, we get a mace, which again, plus d6 damage on the tit roll of a 6. Kind of garbage. Ivor, you can have that. Ninus Maximus is healed by 100 for 1. So again, we're in the position where I could just jump into the room, but I'd rather gather everyone up again. I'm going to try it. How many times can I roll a 1 when we're right at the doorway? It's a new round. We get a power score of 3. Ivor and Naughtiness move back into a position. Naughtiness Maximus is healed one point of damage by Hundert. New round would really like to not roll a one. I do not. We finally get to go into this room. I roll a six, in fact, which gives us the maximum power score of seven. So we launch ourselves as far forward like that and roll on the objective room monster chart. Rolling on the advanced objective room chart, we find that we are going to roll three times on our current battle level, which is not too bad. And in the end, we get three ogres, one gigantic spider, and a stone troll. And of course, Growler the Squig Hound, our objective. So some good, some bad. If we would gotten a lot of weaker enemies, there's a chance that some of them would not have been deployed because they would run out of space. Having a few powerful monsters allows them to concentrate their force. And we are kind of split up and forced to fight these guys one-on-one. -on -one. And of course, we've got the multi-level thing, so if we're attacking a level above, it's a minus one, and they get a plus one to hit us when we're a level below. Still, these are all monsters that we fought before, and I think we can see our way clear of them. And also, the Stone Troll does not take away our nice 7 power, so that helps. This probably being our last combat, we're going to start using some of our magic items. Nunnus Maximus is going to use his Chalice of Vigor, so now everyone who rolls a 6 to hit adds an extra d3 damage. Leaf goes berserk like a good barbarian and attacks the ogres. He passes his fear test, which is nice, and slays the ogre which popped up behind him. 
Hundert is also unafraid of these ogres. I am very tempted not to attack these guys at all because Hundert is next to that pit and it's about as likely that he falls into the pit as does any damage, but I decide I'm gonna go for it. And I'm rewarded for this courage. Hundred is not afraid of the ogre and he sticks him for three damage and more importantly doesn't fall into the pit while he tries to do it. Nodinus is up next and unfortunately the stone troll is kind of scary and so he is going to be minus one to hit. His first attack with a fist spike misses, his second attack misses while rolling a one which means that he would normally be going into the pit. But I have a lucky charm which allows me to re-roll one die per adventure. I'm going to use that now. If it were a later attack, I might be tempted to see what happens when I go into the pit and save any rerolls for if I roll a 1 there, but I really don't want to lose my two knee spike attacks and my final fist spike attack, so I'm going to use it here. And again, I get rewarded by rolling a 6, which means he is going to do 4 plus 3d6 plus d3 damage, which means he does a nice 12 points of damage. He follows that up by a knee, which rolls phenomenally and gets 11 points of damage. Then the next knee crits for another 6. Stone trolls only have 25 health as opposed to the normal trolls who have 30, so that kills this troll. I'd say that went very well. We're over to Ivor Shando. He is unfortunately afraid of ogres. Nonetheless, it's his time to roll a crit with a natural six and does nine points of damage to the ogre in front of him. He misses with his second attack, but then he gets to use the boots of battle. It is a minus one to hit because of being afraid, minus one to hit because I'm trying to kick while being a dwarf. Nonetheless, he hits with that final attack and kills off that ogre. So all of our warriors have attacked, but there is still some power sitting around, and I'm not too worried about the damage I'll be taking. So, Hundert is going to go and blast this hound that is the reason for all this trouble. He has to make a fear check, because if he fails, the spell will cost one extra power, but he passes, so he doesn't have to worry about that. This time I'm going to cast a lightning bolt and I'm going to try and zap this thing. I'm going to successfully cause five points of damage, which isn't bad. Although I'd really rather he was dead all the way. So I'm going to dip into that power reserve of mine. I'm going to use two power to cast freeze. Unfortunately, in a couple of ways, I only roll a one. So one model takes one point of damage. I choose Growler, brings him up to six. And because I got confused when going through his stats, I thought he had nine health. Actually, he only has six. He should have been dead at this point, but he's going to stay on the board. This is an especially brutal Growler, the Squig Hound. He's got nine health instead of six. Yeah, yeah, that's what he had. Not, I made a mistake. He's just tougher. So over to the monster phase, and Growler's kind of mad about this whole thing. Mad about being almost dead. And he is going to bite Nodinus Maximus twice for a total of nine points of damage. The gigantic spider is attacking Ivor and successfully webs him, so he has to try and break free of those during his turn. And Leaf the Legbiter is missed by the final ogre. New round, and again we get the max power score of 7. We're going to start off right away with the freeze spell from Hundert. Try this again. This time we roll a 3, which is nice because there's 3 enemies left on the board. Growler is finally dead, and 3 points of damage go on the ogre and the gigantic spider. Leaf wheels on the ogre fighting him, but only manages to do 9 points of damage. These ogres have 13 health. Hundert is trapped between naughtiness and a webbed Ivor, and so he is happy where he is. Nodinus Maximus makes a break for the stairs at the back of the room, and Ivor fails to break free of the webbing. So normally that would be it, but I'm real close to finishing off this whole adventure. So, Nodinus Maximus is going to break out his time freeze ring, and the warriors are gonna do it again. Leaf starts up again, and this time he manages to kill the ogre. He is also unafraid of the spider and puts four damage on it. Hundert moves around to the right-hand side to get away from that pit as usual, and Nodinus sprints up the stairs and goes to attack the spider. He immediately goes and crits it for 11 points of damage and then finishes it off with his remaining attack. That's it, all the monsters are gone. Just to see if Ivor would have broken out of his webs, I roll for that, and he fails. Eh, typical. That's okay. We grab a tooth from Growler the Squig Hound to prove that we killed him, we gather up our webbed up dwarf, and we head through the secret exit at the back. Okay, so we had a little bit of trouble getting through the objective room door, but it all went reasonably quickly. 
Another successful mission, only one layer of the Orc Lord adventure left to do, but I do want to advance my warriors. I've been sitting on a pile of cash, a bunch of them can go up a level, but I keep getting lost on the way to town. But first thing first, we gotta go find this marauder chieftain at his hunting lodge and show him the tooth so we can get paid. Unfortunately, as you would think for the louts of chaos, we roll on the chart and somewhere between the secret exit and the hunting lodge, we lose this tooth. And so the chieftain doesn't believe us. He's really mad about the whole thing and he kicks us out of his lands and we've made a powerful enemy. I don't know what happened. Each of my guys blames the other. It's possible we all thought the other person was getting the tooth in the first place. Oh well, with the Louts of Chaos, once the fighting is done and the thinking starts, this is the kind of thing you're going to get. But now really we come to the important part. I want to get to a city in order to train. Now we could train at a town, it takes less time to get there, less rolls on the hazards table, and I know I've messed up these rolls trying to get to a city in the past, but we used very few of our re-rolls in this adventure. And I did find out that these things can be used in these post-game rolls, so I'm, I'm determined at this point. I'm going to use the re-rolls if I need to in order to get to a city. So, six rolls on the hazard table, let's start off. First roll is 36, Lightning. This is a terrible one. One of my warriors at random loses two pieces of armor because a lightning bolt strikes them in the middle of the night. No thank you, that could be really debilitating. I instead am going to use a reroll from Leaf. We're going to reroll the tens digit. We get a two instead and we get guests. So instead of camping out on the big rocky cliff, we are instead going into a local village and there's a big party going on, which is exactly the kind of thing that the louts would be into. Well, we kind of make a big nuisance of ourselves. We eat and drink a lot. And so naughtiness feels compelled to pay the villagers 40 gold at the end. Much better. Next hazard roll, we get 64, fall. So on our trek, Leaf the Leg Biter goes and falls off a cliff, gets himself hurt. We add two more weeks, so all these rolls have been for nothing so far. And we also have to lose 30 gold in order to pay for his, I don't know, a medical visit copay. So back at it, still have six rolls on this chart to make. Next one is 56, uneventful, perfect. Next one, 15, stranger. We pick up some random guy on the road who says he knows a shortcut, but he wants some guys to travel with him. Well, turns out he doesn't really know the shortcut, but we do get 40 gold for letting him tag along. Four more to go. We roll again, and we get 15 again. So we're traveling down this guy's shortcut, and we meet another stranger who says, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Follow me instead. Turns out he also doesn't know which way he's going, but he will give us another 40 gold. So we've got a little party of just random lost idiots. Next, we have 33, Uneventful Week. Perfect. Two events to go, and we get 34, Bad Map. Bad Map means that instead of going to a city, we end up in a village. I can't have that. I'm going to reroll that tens digit again. Again, we're going to use one of Leaf's Lucky Charms. This time, we get 24, which is an Uneventful Week. Much better. Last roll, possibly, we get 32, Famine. We pass through some poor Norse village that has been hit by, I don't know, Nurgle cursed all their cattle or something like that. Anyway, we feel bad for him. Leaf gives him 100 gold. 100 gives him 60 gold. Naughtiness hands over one of his magic items. He gives him a scimitar that does the extra d6 wounds on a roll of a 6. And Ivor also loses 100 gold. You know what? Worth it. We're on and into the city. Had to burn a bunch of rerolls to do it. Hopefully the settlement events don't make me pay for this. But we made it. First of all, 100 Luff Balloon really wants to go up to level 3. As he goes into town, he gets an extra 20 gold from an investment that he found a couple adventures back. He does manage to find the Wizard's Guild. Really easy to do when you're looking to roll a 7 on 3d6. I'm not actually sure, as far as wizard training, that you actually need to find a Wizard's Guild in order to do this. It makes sense, but I couldn't actually find it in the book. Anyway, he pays 4,000 gold to get to level 3. He gets another 6 power, bringing him up to 17 power. That's a lot of reserve power that he can play with. For spells, since he's going up to battle level 3, he gets to roll 3d6, and those will determine the levels that he can use. He also has the Tablet of Adain, a magical item that allows him to re-roll these, but I roll a 4, 5, and 6, and I figured those are pretty good. Anyway, I pick up Levitate for my level 4 because there were some situations in other games where that would have been really handy to get out of blocked passageways or pits or that kind of thing. 
For level 5, I pick up a Fire Hammer that does 3d6 damage to a target in base contact with my wizard. So pretty good attack spell. And then I get Resurrection for my level 6, which is just I bring back someone who has died. So if one of these shamans finally gets their act together and blows up one of my guy's heads, or if someone falls down a pit and dies permanently, I can use that spell to revive them. So, so long as 100 is still alive, the chances of actually losing a character have gotten pretty, pretty low. And for doing so well in combat, he also gets plus one attack and plus one weapon skill. Ivor also has enough gold to go up to battle level three. So we do that, pays his 4,000 gold, gets plus one will, plus one initiative, which now puts him at the same level as Naughtiness. So he might actually go before him some games. Plus five wounds, plus one toughness, and the Grudge Lord skill. Grudge Lord means that once per dungeon he can choose one monster and he is plus one to hit that monster and earns double gold if he kills it. It's okay, I guess. Nodinus Maximus, meanwhile, has enough gold to go up to level four. So he finds the pit fighting school. He pays his 8,000 gold. He has to roll on a chart to see what happens when he steps in the doors. He rolls double ones, which could be really bad, but thankfully as a pit fighter, he adds one to that roll. So he gets three, so he has to fight Big Brutus. Thankfully, he does win, and he earns a whole ten gold. The first thing that he's going to do is go over to the armory and try and pick up more pit armor. He rolls really well. Again, thankfully, the city allows you to roll 3d6 on the stock, so he gets three pieces of pit armor. I don't see anything that says that you can't roll multiple times to see if you can pick up something. There are some items in the main rule book that say that you can only try and get one of these every time you visit this location. Pit armor is not one of those items, so he gets armor for his right arm, left arm, and his head. It doesn't do a lot for him, but it does mean that he's now always going to be plus one toughness, no matter what role the monster uses to hit him, because the only thing that uh, is not covered would be the role of a one, and a one always misses. Anyway, going up to level four, he's going to get d6 wounds, he gets another three, which is fine, and he gets nine training points. So again, really the best thing to do would be to buy another die of damage, but it's just ridiculous. He'd be too powerful if he's allowed to do that. So instead, I go and buy himself plus one attack, plus one wound, and a skill. I'm going to try and roll on the skill chart because there are some really good ones. I roll another double one on the skill chart, which gives me Dirty Blow. Dirty Blow, I have to admit, is pretty characterful. It means on the hit roll of a six, I can ignore up to two points of armor because I've stuck him in a very hurdy spot. It's funny, but it's really kind of only okay. There are some much better skills on that chart. So I go and I take a risk. I use one of my rerolls to go and reroll one of the dice on here. See if I can get something a little bit better. And sure enough, I do. I end up with the skill Kick which means now I can go back to the armory and try and buy toe blades, giving me an extra attack that ignores armor. So now that I'm level four, I've got 2d6 damage, I've got four attacks with the fist spike, two with the knee spikes, and one with the kick, because of course I went over to the armory and immediately managed to find the toe blades and pay for them. So that is a grand total of seven attacks every round. Not only that, I'm going to use that silver stone that I picked up in last adventure, and I'm going to make my toe blades magical. So now they are going to do an extra d6 damage on the tit roll of a six. Absolutely brutal. Finally, we have Leaf the Leg Biter. Leaf, maybe if I sold a bunch of equipment, he could also go up to battle level four. The thing is, there's one more adventure on this layer of the Orc Lord expansion. If I go up to level four, now the average of the group is four and I'd have to roll on the monster level four to five chart. And I just don't have enough models to really use that chart. So I'm just gonna waste some time in town. I do get 50 gold from his investment. I go to see the armor. I do manage to buy light armor, so that's gonna bump up his toughness to nine. Settlement event, I get a good deed, which means I try and help out an old lady and, of course, get knocked on the back of the head and robbed for 40 gold. Just what happens. Next thing I'm doing is I just bought this light armor. I don't want it to be a fake, which is one of the settlement events, which means that it's worthless. So I'm going to go to the general store. I'm just going to buy something. I can't believe I haven't done this before. I'm going to buy casks of beer. What are the louts of chaos doing wandering around without any casks of beer? So I buy three of those. And the settlement event, I find a guy on a wanted poster and get a reward of 20 gold pieces. 
then I decide I might go see how Nonus Maximus is doing, and I go hang out at the pit fighting school. Manage to find it, and you roll on a chart to see what happens when you show up, and I get the whirlwind attack, which means once per adventure I can attack everyone adjacent to me, but I give up all my normal attacks to do so. Not really worthwhile, but, you know, something on my list. An option. Settlement event is an uneventful day. I'm running out of useful things to do, so now I'm going to go to the ale house, because of course he does. At the ale house, he picks up a new skill called Feign Death. So there's some drunk from up north that teaches you that if you lie down and stick your tongue out, monsters could think you're dead and they ignore you. It's not really terribly useful, but there it is. Anyway, I learned that. Settlement event is riotous living. Have a little bit too much fun at the ale house. End up spending another 50 gold there. I've run out of places to visit. Now I'm just rolling settlement events. I get into a fight and I lose. Looks like I picked on the... Chaos Warlord who runs this town. Anyway, I have to give up 200 gold for that. I find a new investment. Why not get a whole bunch of those? Uh, that costs me 300 gold. I am not a good investor. And so by this point, the townsfolk have figured that I am absolutely a sucker and I will pay money for anything. So uh, the temple goes and hits me up on the last day. They want a temple donation. I end up spending 200 gold on that, but it means in the next adventure I can re-roll my first miss. Not really worth it. So there we are. Three of my characters have spent a week training, and Leaf has spent seven days just wandering around getting into trouble. I could spend an extra day, have some of my guys do some extra shopping. It would not be a bad idea to send Ivor to the Dwarf Guildmaster. But we're actually running a little low on funds, so it wouldn't be bad to just end it right here before something terrible happens, which I am used to that occurring. So, that's it for this game. Got my guys all tooled up. Level 3, except of course for Nodinus, who's at level 4. The next game will be the last Lair of the Orc Lord adventure that we're going to do for the Louts of Chaos. And then I'm going to have to paint up some new monsters or something. Some battle level 4 monsters and go back to the regular adventures from the main rulebook. Thanks for sticking with me through another adventure. Leave a comment below if you have any questions, observations, or concerns, and I will see you on the next one.